Happy New Year to you, everyone. Welcome to a brilliant new year. Um, my name is Tokwe, and if you're online, Happy New Year to you, too. Um, I'm co-hosting with Elizabeth. As you can see, we're here this morning to co-host with you. Um, we are going to be taking through the worship session uh, by the worship team led by um, my dear sister, <laughs> Carla, Jessica, <laughs> and John will bring the word shortly. Um, but I just want to remind us that, yes, we entered into a new year in human administrative calendar, but God is not limited by time or season. So if there was anything that we were hoping for, or praying for, or seeking God for, even last year, his steadfast love never ceases. It never ceases. And his mercies are new every morning, every morning. So I just want us to key into that as I invite Elizabeth to come and encourage us to worship. Good morning, everyone, everyone online. Happy New Year. Um, I'd like us to pray together. I'm praying from Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Father, thank you that the child is born, that the son is given, and his name is Jesus, yeah. wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Father, as we come this morning, let us be partakers of the increase of his government and peace, and let our worship uh, usher in that everlasting kingdom uh, which is promised, which he will establish. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you're able to stand, if you could stand with us and those at home, enjoy the presence of God. We're going to sing, Come, let us worship our King. I'm 
great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, the Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great you have done great things, oh God, oh God you do great things. Yes,
Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we thank you for the truths of the words that we're singing. Lord, as we declare this, Lord, cause faith to arise in our hearts. Lord, as we declare this, Lord, cause us to lift up our eyes and look to you, Lord, where you sit enthroned and rule and reign over all things. Lord, where you have all things in your hands. Lord, where you have our lives and our futures. Lord, our hopes and our fears. Lord, they're all in your hand. Lord, thank you that uh, you are just so totally dependable, so totally trustworthy, so totally faithful. Jesus. says this, yeah, I, this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. It's all in the Lord and, and our job is to stir up our hearts, to call to mind and to have hope because of the Lord's faithfulness. Let's do that now. I love you. 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 I love you.
just feel very strongly in my spirit that the Lord wants to remind us of his faithfulness. And what the Lord said to my heart is, ask my people, is there anyone who's been born again for 40 years or over 40 years? Anyone who's been born again for over 40 years, let's wave to the Lord. Let's appreciate God because it's by his faithfulness that we're still standing. The enemy of our souls does not want us to carry on. He doesn't want us to continue to enjoy the blessings, the goodness, the riches, the abundance of his riches. If you have been, if you have been born again for over 30 years, let's wave to God. Let's give God a wave, a wave offering. Over 20 years, over 10 years, over five years, isn't this God good? Isn't it marvelous? Isn't it great? That is the goodness of God. It's the mercy of God. Several times, repeatedly in the Bible, the Lord would introduce himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The God of Abraham is the God that calls. And that God that calls is the God that equips. That God that calls is the one that equips. He's the one that changes name and changes destiny. Look at where you started from. Look at where you began from. Look at where you are today. It is, if it's not for God, who has been for us, 
if it's not for God who has been for us. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. Father, we just bless you. We exalt you, God. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you adoration. Because you remain God forever. And you are good forever. We thank you for your greatness, for your faithfulness. We thank you for being true to your word, for not leaving us, for not forsaking us. That when the enemy of our soul says there is a casting down, your word to us has been there is a lifting up and you have lifted us above principalities above powers above spiritual wickedness in high places so we return to you oh god in praises thank you father thank you lord god let's just continue to lift him high in worship Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up.
my certainty. My heart bows down, surrender in worship to my God and King. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. This God is our God. This great God is our God. This God that never fails is our God. This God that calls into being that which was, was not is our God. The creator of all things is our God. The God who turns situations around he is our God. The savior of the world is our God. The king of all kings is our God. Father, thank you, O oh God, for your presence in this place. Who are we that you are mindful of us, O oh God? Who are we? Oh, blessed be your holy name, Lord. Lord, as we move into the next sessions, Father, continue with us. Let your presence be known, felt, seen in this place, O oh God. We thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just going to invite Sharon to share her testimony and then some, uh, Sam will come and uh, give us the notices. I wanted to share this. It's so amazing. <laughs> And um, I just thought it was like a really good time to set out faith at the beginning of the year and to, to truly know how amazing God is. Um, my daughter George is here today. She's a bit nervous about me talking about it, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> she's, uh, she's, in, she's been living with me. And you know, some of you know I had like hundreds of people, nine adults in the house at some point, and now they've all, you know... God is placing them in amazing places. So um, Georgia's in emergency accommodation. She was in a hotel. This is, her, this is the council place, and they're in a hotel. And then she was placed, and we knew that she was going to be placed in something called Wellfield Court, okay? And this is a place for emergency housing for um, the people of the town. It isn't a great place. It is a place where I do my employment, where I support families there who are very vulnerable, some of them in difficult situations, crisis points, some of them aren't good people, some of them are struggling so much that their behaviour isn't that great. So there were some risks to her being in there and actually, to tell you the truth, it frightened me so much that I couldn't sleep and it, it was stressing me out and I was, uh, I don't know how this is going to work, I've got to go into there to do my job, I didn't want people to know she was my child. So I was like praying about it and I wasn't not giving it to God, but I was doing it. I was doing it. I was giving it to God. I was saying, you know, please, God, like just don't put her in the shared house. She ended up in the shared house and three families in there we were working with, one of which I didn't want her to be near. 
So I was back again praying, praying. I was doing it. I was praying. I was doing it. But it was me doing it. Long story short, I came to church. Something hit me and went, why are you not asking people to pray? Why are you not asking the people of God to pray? Why are you not doing that? So I did that that morning. I literally spoke to some select people. I'd WhatsApp people. I'd text up, tasked people to pray specifically. God, break into this situation. Take her from somewhere unsafe and put her somewhere safe. And he did. <laughs> he didn't just take her out of the shared house and put her in a studio flat, which, I, you know, would have been great. You know, wouldn't have been great, but it would have been okay within the different part of the building. It would have been better. But he wanted better than better. He removed her from that place altogether. She is in her own self-contained <laughs> studio flat. It's still emergency accommodation, but she's got safety. She's got security. And, you know, it's showing her... God is showing himself to me, and he's showing himself to Georgia that he is in our lives and it builds faith and that's how it should, that's what I want this morning, that's what I feel God wants to do, that's what he's been doing all morning, building faith, opening up yourself to whatever possibilities you don't even know what God can do in your life, but he's bigger than all the circumstances and he will complete his work in you, no matter what it is, so thank you God. Yes, God's been working. Um, for those of you who weren't here a fortnight ago and didn't hear what I said about um, my grandchildren in Hungary, my son in England, and how God had opened a little crack so that Matthew and I were actually able to address the problem without discomfort. Uh, last Tuesday, I rang Matthew up. That little crack has been thrown wide open. And I would encourage all who are praying for members of their family, particularly who are in a difficult situation, particularly if they're not very good at talking about it or, to, you know, doing anything, but just saying, oh, I don't know. But looking in the sky for years... I've taken that middle eight. He treasures the broken and makes them whole. Yeah. I'd always thought of it as one person, particularly Matthew, but he's talking about groups of people, families. I confess to being a member of a dysfunctional family, but God is into mending dysfunctional families as well. Matthew has been having the equivalent of Zoom meetings with his ex-wife and his two sons. And he said their English is improving. They have been learning it at school, but also Engli English-speaking films. <laughs> Don't know what, but anyway. And he says, you know, he, w he was describing some of the things that they'd been doing. And um, there are, Catalin is a bit sort of worried about them being into explosives, and I said to Matthew, well, with you for a father, you know, what can you expect? I remember him having huge, great fireworks, exploding them up the garden and setting everybody's house alarms on fire, you know. So the fact that, oh, and yesterday, um, John and I received some photos and videos from Catalin because we haven't had anything from her for over three years. Now, we haven't, because of certain circumstances, irrelevant, we haven't actually looked at them, but I've got those to look at later today. I feel that God, uh, Matthew's aiming to go to Hungary. He's got to get through various hoops, but he has changed over the, year, the last year out of all recognition. Instead of a little sort of... Uh, if I ring him up, I have to have um, questions to which the answers are not yes and no. Now he'll talk for 40, 40 50 minutes now about all sorts of stuff. And the channels of communication are... <laughs> I can't stretch my eyes, arms wide enough. So 
God will do it. You may have to wait quite a long time, but in Habakkuk it says it, the promise will come. Sit and wait. Look for it. It will come. So look out for the promises. It's good, isn't it? Very encouraging. God is excellent. Um, I have the notices, just in case you weren't here at the beginning, to be wished a Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, 2022, I'm going to be remembering to write that down, um, hopefully. So things coming up this week. Um, on Wednesday, we are having our first Encounter monthly prayer meeting of the, of the year. So that'll be exciting. Wednesday, the 5th January, we'll be here at 8 p.m., Last for about an hour and a quarter. We're just, I assume we're doing what we've been doing for the last nearly a year now, actually, scarily, uh, which is just spending some time um, in God's presence, praising, worshipping, praying uh, together. It's all been really excellent times, and I would encourage you, if you can be there, it's a really great place to be. Um, so do come along. Yes, lots of murmurs of agreement there, in case you needed more encouragement. Um, on Friday, Coffee Shop is back. Okay, so just in case you missed that, co coffee, coffee Shop became Coffee and Cake and reduced its menu a little bit to Coffee and Cake, um, as you might imagine. Um, but Coffee Shop is returning uh, this week um, and, and onwards with light lunches. Um, so you can go along on a Friday lunchtime, um, have, have lunch and coffee and cake. Those will be there as well, the coffee and the cake, because they're both still very good. So do go to that. Um, you may remember towards the end of last year, we collected some money. We, we wanted to raise some money um, so that um, one of the families of one of the, of the churches that we support in Zimbabwe, they could purchase a laptop um, for uh, the son who needed a laptop to do, to do his university type work. School, schooling, schooling. Um, there's a photo, in fact, there we go, lovely, um, of the laptop that we that they were then able to buy with the money um, that we collectively raised. Um, I have an extra notice um, on the end of that then, which is that we raised so much money collectively as a family that, um, that, yeah, uh, that um, we were able to send money for two more young people in Zakia's church. Um, to, be, to get so they can also get laptops and continue their studies. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, everyone who, who gave so generously. Um, makes a big difference in the lives of three, three young people. And thank you to Jan and John for sort of sorting all of that out and coordinating it. Okay, um, it's the beginning of a new year. Um, it's a really good time to start a sort of Bible in one year type thing i'm going to be doing that this year just you know we've been talking to the young people about it in the uh last few months of last year um and uh yes yeah, so we as gig are going to be doing the uh well some some from gig i think are going to choose to do the uh holy trinity brompton um bible in one year app that you can download on your phone uh, you get a thing every day. Since I last did it, there's now even an express version, which doesn't take more than 10 minutes, um, I'm, I'm told. I'm not certain they haven't... A <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Shirley tells me sometimes it's as long as 14 minutes, but I think even then, 14 minutes a day is quite doable. Um, if you are young or you feel like you're a young person, there's even a youth version of it with a nice New Zealand man who comes on at the beginning um, and make it, you know, reminds you that there are young people as well as um, Nicky Gumbel. I'm not sure they haven't achieved the speed of the thing by just turning Nicky Gumbel's speed up to 1.5, by the way. Um, I think that might be part of how they get it done so quickly. Um, but it's still really good. Uh, all, the, all the stuff that's in there is, is good stuff from the last time that I remember doing it. So I'm looking forward to doing that. If you would like to do that, you can download the apps on your phones or whatever, or you can do it on a computer, I think, probably, but I don't really know how you do that. Um, if you have any issues with any of that, then collar a young person. Um, they could help you out. Um, if you would like a different option, you can also read the whole New Testament in a year. Um, so you can do slightly less reading, probably. If you, in, in some sort of wonderful 
work of God. If you read one chapter every weekday for a year, you will read all of the chapters of the New Testament. That's good, isn't it? Um, and that just yeah, gives you the weekends to catch up on anything you might have missed as well. So um, that's really good. If you'd like to do that, um, there's a plan for, for that on some blue sheets of paper at the back by the door where you came in under the TV. It's an A4 sheet printed on blue paper. You can pick one of those up and give that a go as well. Um, I have also done that, and it I can recommend as a good way of reading reading something new every day and getting getting God's word in you. Cool. Right, there is no children's work or youth work or anything this morning because uh, it's still sort of the Christmas holidays, uh, but there will be next week. Um, so you're all in here, but I think there's probably some like colouring stuff at the back. And if there isn't, then I don't know. Good luck. Um, <laughs> this morning's special offering is for HIM. Um, there are some details about how you could give to that on the screen at the moment, um, or you can put some money in the pots at the back. Um, there's pot, a pot there for the Himalayan Inland Mission, but also for uh, tithing for the regular giving that supports everything we do here in general. If you're visiting this morning, please don't feel you have to take part in that in any way. Um, but if you, you, put, you can if you like. Um, that's the end of the notices, I think. Uh, yes, good, right, so um, don't think that, because nobody's going anywhere, so I guess just stay there and Dad's going to come and preach. <laughs> so if I, when Phil comes back from the toilet... Every, every Sunday, so that, that's just doubly difficult this morning. Too much information, I know, but I, wanted to, I want, but I wanted to do that. Okay, well, before we get into this, just to kind of state the obvious, isn't God amazing? Yeah. Come on, let's not lose, we, we've heard, we've actually had, we've had two, heard two stories this morning of people in the church congregation where God has done something amazing that seemed impossible. Don't lose the impact of that. And, and, and don't lose the impact of what God has done through us to bless three families in Zimbabwe, who, to them, it would have looked like a completely impossible situation. And yet God has used us to come through. And I include myself in, in, in this, but we tend to be terribly British about this, don't we? God does amazing things and we give him a little round of applause like he's just played a good shot of golf. <laughs> kind, of like, kind of like, nice one, Lord. That's, a, that's another really good one you've done. So what I want us to do is get up on our feet and let's give God a proper round of applause and maybe even a cheer <laughs> for what he's done. Yes, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are... Amazing! You are amazing, Lord. You have done great things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yes, that is a bit more like it for the King of Kings, isn't it? Comes our opening song was, Lord, you do great things. And here he is doing great things in the middle of us. And it's fantastic, isn't it? Whoa, come and do more. Oh, I feel quite excited now. Yes, God is, God is so good, isn't he? Now let's, let's keep looking to him and his faithfulness. Let's keep asking him to do great things among us. Been a, it's been another good morning for what I'm going to speak on, actually. I, I love the way God, I love the way God, God does that. We're going to be thinking, actually, this morning um, about our faithfulness towards God as we've been thinking about his faithfulness towards us and, and hearing um, stories about how faithful he is to us. We're going to be thinking about our faithfulness 
towards him. So we've come to the, uh, the fourth talk in our series looking at uh, the birth of Jesus from Luke's Gospel. And we've come to another of those Bible passages that never gets read at Christmas. It's just like Zechariah and Mary, never gets read at Christmas. I've never spoken on this before. I've never heard anybody speak on this passage before, although I'm sure uh, somebody must have done at some point over the last 2,000 years. Um, it, as I say, it, 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 nobody speaks about this, but it's another aspect of the, uh, the narrative of Jesus' birth that Luke thought it was important to include. So we're going to include it. And we're going to sing that, see that actually this brings some important new revelation about the nature of God's salvation plan that he has put into um, motion through the birth of Jesus. Remember, that's where we left it two weeks ago um, with Jesus uh, being born in Bethlehem. Uh, and then, uh, as I've just said, it has some things to say to us by way of application. So uh, let's get on and read it. Um, if, you, if you want to follow it, we're in Luke chapter 2, um, and we're going to start at verse 21, or it will appear on the screen, and I shall read it to you. So on the eighth day, that's the eighth day after Jesus was born, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name that the angel had given him before he was conceived. And when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also uh, a prophet, Anna, the husband of uh, Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She'd lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. And when Mary, Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. So we are going to take this uh, in two sections. First of all, we're going to look at what, it, um, what the story of the encounter with Simeon and Anna tells us about God's salvation plan. And then I want to um, spend some time drawing some application for us about what this teaches us about how we respond to God and look to serve him. So I'm going to pray and then we'll get going. So Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, come and open our hearts and our minds to what you want to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, this part of the birth narrative takes place in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and it's 40 days after Jesus' birth. 
And Mary and Joseph are in the temple because they're there to fulfill the requirements of the law of Moses. There's, there's two things going on here. Um, Jesus has been, three things, Jesus has been circumcised, we read in verse 21, and named eight days out of his, after his birth. And now there's these two further requirements of the law to be fulfilled. First is the presentation to the Lord. This was a, was a requirement that every uh, firstborn male um, be presented to God because every firstborn male belonged to the Lord. Um, and then the parents could redeem or buy back their child, and I think every parent would buy back their child, um, for the price of five shekels. And then there was the purification of the mother. The Lord said that every mother um, who gave birth to a boy was ceremonially uh, unclean for 40 days and then had to make an offering for purification. And that offering was a lamb plus a dove or a pigeon. But if you were too poor to afford a lamb, uh, you could replace the lamb with another dove or a pigeon. So the point here is, let's not get bogged down in the detail of the law, because that all seems a little bit strange to us, doesn't it? But the, 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 the point to see here is, is that right at the beginning of his life, Jesus is fulfilling the law. See, Jesus came to perfectly fulfill the law that we can't keep, so that he might obtain a perfect righteousness, live a perfect life under the law, that God then gives to us by faith when we put our faith in Jesus. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Galatians. He says, when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So Jesus is fulfilling the requirements of the law. Note there's an irony here. They carry in their arms the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. They're carrying the Lamb of God that is going to um, provide um, purification for sin, the true purification from sin. And yet they are too poor themselves to afford a lamb. And so they bring two birds, which is the offering of a poor family. And it's further proof, if needed, that Jesus was not born into wealth or privilege, but Jesus was born into an ordinary poor family. So this is um, a very common ceremony. There would have been many families there doing exactly the same thing that day. There would have been nothing to have marked them out as particularly special and noteworthy, but they attracted the attention of two mysterious strangers, uh, a man and a woman, Simeon and Anna. And all we know about them is what's written in this passage. The Bible doesn't tell us anything else about them. What we do know is that Simeon is described as righteous and devout, so he's a godly man in terms of his behavior, um, and in terms of paying attention to the law. He's righteous and devout. Many commentators assume him to be old um, because of what he says. He says, I'm ready now to die because I've seen the, the Messiah. So everybody assumes that he's old, and we're going to assume he's old this morning. It doesn't actually say that. He's described as having a continuing presence of the Holy Spirit on him. That is an incredibly rare thing before Pentecost. There are so few characters in the Bible um, of whom that is said. Um, so this is quite a special guy, even though he just gets a few verses and then we never hear of him again. And um, he clearly has a prophetic gift because he prophesies. Um, and it says he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's just a, a, a funny way of saying that he's waiting for the promised Messiah to come. So he's one of those people like Zechariah and Elizabeth. Um, and uh, it's clear from the passage there's a few others in Jerusalem um, who haven't given up hope. But they're the ones who are still uh, have got faith in God's promise that he is going to send a Messiah who is going to deliver them. And he's carrying a very specific promise that he's not going to die until he sees God's Messiah. 
And then there's Anna. Well, we know Anna is old. Um, she's very old because it gives her age as 84. And you might think, well, that's old, but that's not very old. But you need to remember that life expectancy in those days was probably about our middle age. So if you want to catch the impact of this, if, if, if we were kind of like transporting this to the 21st century, we'd, we'd probably want to, to get the impact of it. You'd say uh, she was well over 100 or something like this. This is a very old lady for, the, for, for, for this time. And she is given a very rare and honoured title of prophet. And again, not many people in the Bible get the title of prophet. And she's looking for exactly the same thing as Simeon, the redemption of Jerusalem. That's just another way of saying consolation of Israel, which is another way of saying waiting for the Messiah. So while Luke didn't just say they were waiting for the Messiah, I don't know. It would have saved me explaining all that. But they're waiting for the same thing. And she's devoted her life to serving God in worship and prayer. So they're both looking for the same thing. They're both responsive to the Holy Spirit. We're not told what Anna says. It's only that she spoke about the child, but we, we can assume she said very similar things to what Simeon said. But it's what Simeon said that's been recorded, because clearly that was very memorable for Mary. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's virtually certain that, that, that Luke has this story and this detail because he got it from Mary. So in response to seeing Jesus... Simeon takes the baby up in his arms and he prophesies over him. And this prophecy comes in two parts. So the first part is verses 29 to 32. Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of of your people Israel. It's written in the form of a song. And just like um, Zechariah's prophecy, if you can remember back to the beginning of December, um, it's a song that's actually been sung by the church for hundreds of years. It goes under the title of the Nunc Dimittis. For those of you who come from a traditional church background, you may have heard of that. Um, that is just the first couple of words from the first line of the prophecy in Latin. That's where that, that comes from. But it's a sacred song that's been much loved and sung um, by God's people uh, since the fourth century, I believe. So a very long, very long time. And the importance of this is that it brings us some fresh revelation about the nature of God's salvation. You probably haven't noticed this, but if you go back and have a look... Up until now, all the messages about the nature of Jesus' mission, why he has come, have come from angels. And it's either been directly stated or implied that Jesus is Israel's long-awaited saviour. Well, the revelation that now comes through the Holy Spirit by the prophetic word is that Jesus is the saviour for the whole world. And we kind of lose the impact of that, don't we? Because we're, we're the beneficiaries of the fact that God's salvation wasn't just for the Jews, but for the whole world. So we kind of think, yeah, and. But actually, this is a bombshell. Into, into that Jewish culture um, where all thoughts of the coming Messiah were taken up with deliverance for the nation of Israel to suddenly go, whoa, this is a saviour for the whole world. This is, this is a bombshell. This is God's salvation prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. I mean, it's such a, a, a bombshell that it was very offensive. I mean, just th think of your go uh, gospel stories and through Acts. Um, Jesus and then the early church were always coming up against Jews who were very offended that Jesus had come for the Gentiles as well as for the Jews. But they shouldn't have been, actually, because this is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So they should have known, um, and Isaiah prophesied it. Uh, several prophecies in Isaiah that talk about 
um, a saviour coming that was going to be a light for the Gentiles. Gentiles. So people shouldn't have been surprised, but actually this was a bombshell, but it is very good news for us. And Israel's glory? Well, Israel's glory is not going to come with um, a great conquering military political messiah who is going to make Israel um, the chief nation in the whole world that's going to boss all the other nations around, which is, was the common belief that that's what the messiah was going to do. Um, but actually, Israel's glory is the fact that the messiah and the saviour of the world has come through them. That's the true glory of Israel. And then the second part of the prophecy... Well, that's to Mary. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. We're usually very keen for personal prophecy, aren't we? Whenever, you know, if somebody comes visiting and they bring a prophetic team with them, we're all sitting there going, me? Please prophesy over me. Um, but this isn't the sort of personal prophecy that you'd be thrilled if you got. <laughs> this is actually a real, this, this, this is a tough one for Mary, and, and almost certainly the, the reason why it was so memorable for her. <clears throat> See, this part of um, the revelation about Jesus. Is, is a key part of the Christmas message. And yet it never makes it ever into the top nine uh, Christmas readings. I, 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 I would reckon that very few of you have ever heard this passage read as part of the Christmas reading. Nine lessons and carols or what have you. It doesn't make it to it. But it, but it should do. It should do. This passage should be included in the Christmas readings because it tells us that Christmas is not all sweetness and light. It tells us that salvation is going to come at a cost. It's not going to come through the glorious overthrow of Israel's enemies. It's going to come by uh, the Messiah, by the Saviour, actually entering into his people's sufferings. See, this saviour and his offer of salvation, well, they're not going to be universally accepted. He and his message are going to cause conflict and division. Those who reject him are going to fall. And those who accept him are going to rise. And that word uh, rise um, elsewhere uh, is used of resurrection. So it's rise in, in, in the sense of rising to new life. So this, this is talking about receiving eternal life. Those who reject him are going to fall. They're going to fall away. Those who accept him are going to rise to eternal life. Jesus is going to be a sign. He's going to be a sign pointing to the work of God. It, particularly, he's going to point to the love of God. And yet, he's going to be spoken against. Not everybody is going to be thrilled with the message that he brings. So he's come to bring light, and he's come to bring life, but not everybody wants to come into the light, and not everybody wants to receive that life. Jesus himself said that, that uh, some people prefer darkness to light, they don't, because they don't want their evil deeds to be exposed by the light. So Jesus and his message um, have always caused <coughs> offence to some people and you will probably know that it still does. In fact, increasingly in our society, um, the message of Jesus um, is seen as offensive because it's seen as intolerant. It's ever been so. But how people respond to Jesus reveals what's in their hearts. And then lastly, Mary is told that there's going to be a great personal cost to her. A sword will pierce your own soul 
two. And the word for sword there, that's for a large sword. So we're not talking about a little dagger, um, but what Simeon is saying, that, there's, that a large sword is going to pierce your soul too. Mary's going to find herself with uh, many difficulties in life. Um, there's the glory and the wonder of receiving God's favour and carrying the Messiah. And yet she's, <clears throat> excuse me, she's always going to be carrying around um, that faint hint of scandal that her son was conceived outside of marriage. And when Phil was talking to us about Mary, he made the point, didn't he, that, that um, sort of sexual purity was an absolute given in that society. So Mary's always going to carry around that hint of scandal. Um, if you read the Gospels, you'll see there's times when she misunderstood him, even times when she was opposing what he was doing. But ultimately, this is pointing to the cross, isn't it? This is where uh, she's going to have the pain of seeing her own child uh, rejected by the people he came to save and put to death in a very cruel way. And all of this adds a very, dif a very different angle to the Christmas message, doesn't it? Yes, there is salvation that's arrived in Jesus. Yes, it's available to everybody who will accept it. Yes, it will eventually lead to peace on earth. But to get there is going to take suffering and rejection, and the path leads to the cross before we get to the other side. And not everybody is going to accept the message. So let's think about some uh, application then, shall we? Um, I want to make application to two sorts of people today. And the first is those who have never... Uh, responded to God's offer of salvation, to those who have uh, never accepted Jesus um, as your Lord and Saviour. See, Christmas isn't just about angels and shepherds and babies and wise men, great though all that is. Um, actually, Christmas is about our eternal destinies. See, everybody has rebelled against the rule of God. That's what, basically what the Bible calls sin. We all want to be king of our own lives. And we don't want anyone to tell us what to do. And the root of that is pride. And it leads to all sorts of things like selfishness and greed and conflict and you can probably add half a dozen more things. These are all things that spoil our lives. They spoil our relationships with one another. And they even spoil the world in which we live. And God hates sin. So sin separates us from him. And being cut off from God, our spirits, which uh, are made to live in union with God, are dead. Because we're cut off from him. And if nothing changes when we die physically, we remain spiritually dead and separated from God and all that's good forever. And that's what the Bible calls hell. See, the Christmas message is that the true king has come to save us and he requires our allegiance. He's going to make salvation possible for everybody um, who responds through his death on the cross, which is going to make payment for our sins and make forgiveness and reconciliation with God possible. But it isn't automatic. There's a choice to be made. And how each person responds reveals what's in their heart. So for the, those of you in the, this room, who are in that position, you've never responded to Jesus, put your faith and your trust in him, repented of your sins, 
and asked him to come and be Lord of your life, what are you going to choose? For those of you that are watching this online or are going to watch this on Catch Up, if you have never given your life to Jesus, what are you going to choose? I will choose Jesus. Good answer, Jamie. Jamie would choose Jesus. So would I. But you have a choice. Light or darkness? Life or death? And you can make the decision to choose life and light in Jesus today if you want to. So if you're here and that's you and you'd like to know more, please do come and talk to me at the end of the meeting. And if that's you and you're watching this online or on Catch Up, um, if you know somebody who's a Christian, speak to them and they'll explain things more or you can contact us through our website um, or by email. And we'd love to talk to you and help you. And then I want to speak um, to those who have accepted Jesus as their saviour. I want to speak to those of us who have repented of our sins and committed our lives to follow Jesus. Because I think that Simeon and Anna are a challenge to how we live our lives. And I think um, in the providence of God, it's quite appropriate that we're looking at this at the start of a new year when traditionally uh, we evaluate what we're doing with our lives. So I want to say two things to us. First of all, about serving God effectively into old age. And slides come off a bit quicker than I intended, but uh, one commentator has described Simeon um, and Anna's desire to see God's Messiah as the oldest bucket list in the world. <laughs> and that's a reference to that 2007 film starring Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. Anybody seen that film? Yeah, okay. That's a film about two terminally ill men who agree on a list of things they want to do before they die. So before they kick the bucket, hence the term, the bucket list. Okay, now I'm guessing that even if you've never written anything down, or maybe even if you've never thought about this before, that I'm guessing that probably all of us have some sort of a bucket list in our heads. Things that you would like to do whilst you're still on the planet. So the question is, what's on your bucket list? So just take 30 seconds to turn to somebody near you and share one or two things that are on your bucket list. What would you like to do whilst you're still on the planet? Just very quickly, you may have to move. Okay, hopefully that's enough time for you to have at least shared one thing. If, you've, if, you, haven't, if you haven't got anything, that's absolutely fine, but I've shared something. Let me, te let me tell you what is on, uh, what's on my bucket list then. So I, I would love to learn to play jazz piano. So that's, 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 that's on my list. I would like to learn to play another musical instrument. Jessica, Jessica knows the saxophone is the one that I quite fancy, but I'd like to learn another musical instrument. Um, I would like to travel to some places. I'd love to go to New Zealand. There's some places in the States I'd like to see. I'd like to uh, see New England in the fall and some of the places in more to the west of the USA. I'd like to see a lot more of Italy. Now, this is one that you're meant, you, is meant to make you feel really sorry for me. I would like to have sorted out all my paperwork. That's on my, that's on my bucket list too. I'd also, like to, I'd also like to see us enter into all of the things that God has promised us prophetically as a church 
in my in my generation whilst I'm still around to at least see some of it. Yeah. See, it's not wrong to uh, have dreams of visiting faraway places um, or of taking up hobbies. Um, it is a bit sad if you want to get your paperwork done. <laughs> um, but yeah, these, thi these things aren't wrong. But uh, wh what I wanted to say is don't leave pursuing the kingdom of God off your list. Don't leave God out of your plans. It's worth each of us asking, isn't it? What, what, what would you still like to accomplish for God in whatever time you have left? Worth asking, isn't it? See, many of us have reached retirement age when we've stopped working in whatever career or sphere we've been working in for most of our lives, but you still don't have enough time to do all the things that you want to do, apparently. That's what everybody, that's what everybody says. Uh, and many of us are approaching this phase of our, our lives. I'm starting to think about you know, retirement and what that means and what I'd, what I'd like to do. And um, let me say, there's nothing wrong in looking forward to some rest and relaxation. Nothing wrong with it at all. But it's also worth bearing in mind that in the kingdom of God, there is no official retirement age. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, true rest and reward is waiting for us in the next life. You won't find the fullness of that in this one. See, Simeon and Anna are examples to us, aren't they, of faithfulness to God into old age. It says they were waiting for God to fulfill his promise to send the Messiah, but they weren't passive in that. Waiting isn't necessarily a passive thing. It can be an active thing too. They were actively seeking God and they were available to him. And even into advanced old age, when physically we become much more limited, there's Anna worshipping, fasting, and praying. And the Bible doesn't um, make any comment about that being a second-class role at all, but an honourable one and a valuable one. So, let me applaud those of you who are older among us who are still serving God and available to him. We have many great examples in this congregation of people who have retired from their secular work but haven't retired from serving God. And you guys are a great example to us. But let me encourage um, everybody who is retired and is coming up to retirement, include God in your plans. Who knows what he may still have for you to do whilst you're still on this earth. And I probably should have clicked on at some point. There we go. Just says, don't leave God out of your retirement plans. Okay, and then lastly, I want to say this to, to everybody, actually. It's related to what I've just said, but it applies to all ages. Actually, Simeon and Anna are great examples of finishing the Christian race well, aren't they? Let's click that on. There we go. See, it's not inevitable that we will finish well. There are obvious examples in the Bible that people who, who did... So Jesus would be a great example of somebody who finished well. He's the one who's able to declare from the cross, it is finished. Everything the Father gave him to do, he perfectly fulfilled. Paul, the Apostle Paul, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. That'd be a great thing to be able to say at the end, wouldn't it? There's the Apostle John, isn't there? Faithfully serving God on Patmos. Into, in exile on Patmos into old age when he receives the revelation. But there are many in the Bible who did not finish well. Um, I read 
somebody done a survey of Bible characters in the Bible. Um, these are people with, with uh, some kind of um, sort of responsibility God had given them um, in, in their lives. Um, and of those that we know enough about to know how they sort of st start, middle and end, only about 30% finished well. It's not, not a high number, is it, really? Um, and we will know um, many uh, examples in our own time uh, especially leaders who fall away and don't finish well and make the headlines. But you'll also know people that you have been, you know, brothers and sisters that you've been in fellowship with um, that fall away uh, and just seem to disappear. See, there are um, many things that can cause us to fall away. So things like disappointments particularly if we're disappointed in God for any reason, that can cause us to fall away. Suffering can. And again, Anna is a great example to us, isn't she? I mean, widowed after seven years of marriage. Um, she could have become very bitter and cross at God, couldn't she? But instead, she gave her life to serving God. I've said before on several occasions that, that when difficulties in life come, they can either drive us to God or drive us away from him, depending on how we respond to them. And this is probably a biggie as well, preoccupation with this world. Very easy to get caught up in money and houses and careers and possessions and things like that. Um, and suddenly, people who were really going for God so, are not anymore. They're just distracted or they just or they, they, they just move out of the area where God had them being effective to somewhere else where they're not. And then there's temptation to sin as well, and that takes out people as well. But Simeon and Anna are great examples to us of those who fix their eyes on God, who listen to the Holy Spirit, who are available to him, and who finish their lives well. There we go. Oh. So... What I want to do is finish with these words of encouragement for us from the letter to the Hebrews. I think this is a good verse, a couple of verses for us at the start of a new year. And it goes like this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that includes Simeon and Anna and Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, all these guys that we've met over the uh, past four weeks who uh, finished well. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, and perfecter of our faith. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you that you've given us so many great examples in the Bible of people who faithfully served you. And Lord, in response to all that you've done for us, for this great salvation that you've provided for us, um, for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we want to uh, give ourselves to faithfully following you. Lord, may each person here in this room and following this online, Lord, may we all run the race that is marked out for us and reach the finishing line well. Lord, use us in this brief time that we have on the planet to serve you, to please you, Lord, to be used by you to see your kingdom advanced and Jesus glorified. So we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Okay, let's finish with a song, have the band back. you're able to stand, if you could stand with us as we sing, This Is My Desire. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give. Officially, the end. But uh, as as John was uh, talking to us, it, it dawned on my heart that it would just be good for us to raise a prayer for those that are in in between decisions, for God or not for God, whether they are online or within us here. So, if we can just have one or two people pray out loud for those that are in the throes of decision that they will, the light of God will shine through to their heart and that they would decide for God. They would choose God. So if we can have one or two people just praying to that as we, before we round up.
Yes, Father, Lord, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for your anointing and your gifting upon John, who has led us this morning. Lord, we thank you and we bless you, oh God, for how you have blessed us. Father, we want to pray for John that you will replenish him abundantly for, from your throne room of grace, oh God, for all that he has labored to deliver for, to us this morning. And Father, for all that we have had this morning, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will multiply your word in our hearts, that we will not be hearers only, but we will be doers of your word, Lord. And Lord, even as John has prayed earlier, we want to ask again, Lord, for the grace to finish strong, to f that none of us will fall away, Lord. None of us will become weak or weary in the work of your kingdom but you will empower us to do more in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you praise, our King. In Jesus' name. Amen.